Good. Good morning, Ganubi Baptist. Yay, hey sons. Oh, welcome everybody. Welcome to church this morning. We're so glad that you can join us, um, especially when the weather's a bit miz. We are so glad to be together. And for those joining us on the live stream, welcome to you as well. So just a couple of announcements to kickstart us. But before we do that, I believe we have a birthday boy in the house, mm-hmm. Uncle Martin. Let's give a little song for Uncle Martin. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Martin. Happy birthday to you. Hip hip. Yay. Happy birthday, Martin. (laughs) Mason didn't tell me your age, but that's irrelevant, right? Yeah, 21 plus bat. Alrighty, so one of the first announcements is on the 18th of May, we have a Builder Burger evening coming up. So um, this is gonna crush Burger King, out of, like absolutely. So it's Builder Burger, it's 50 bucks for the burger. Tickets are available from me after the service. I will go for to, through to the coffee place, so come and grab a coffee and a ticket. And there's also popcorn and juice on sale So yeah, it's going to be a lovely evening just to be together as a church um, outside of the Sunday service and yeah, just spend time together. That is on the 18th of May. All right, then on the 4th of May is Hope School's fundraising tea. So if you want to be a part of it but you don't have a table to sit at, that's okay. Uh, You can contact me in the office or um, you can contact Carol. The number's on there, but you're welcome to come get it from me as well. If you would like to host a table, still that option exists. So that is the 4th of May. And um, Hope Schools is one of our uh, um, organizations that we support. So it's really nice as a church just to get behind them and uh, support them as best we can. And then on Wednesday, this Wednesday, the 24th, 24th, um, at half past six at the church, we're having a prayer and praise evening. So it's church leadership, but anybody who would like to join and just come and Um, pray for the church, pray for our country, pray for the world, is very welcome. Um, We're just going to get together and have a bit of worship and some prayer. So you're very welcome to join us for that. And today we have a very special guest, um, all the way from Pretoria, is it? So we have Joe Davies with us this morning, and um, as a staff leadership, we we had the privilege of going to the Logos Hope and uh, going to a pastor's conference, and Joe shared, and it was an amazing um, yeah, time just to hear what you have to say, Joe. So we're excited to, to get to sit under that again this morning. So won't you come up and share with us? Good morning, everybody. It's so lovely to be with you here today on this really weird weather day. <laughs> So um, many of you might know me um, in different ways. Perhaps you know me as Joe Davy, the daughter of Shirley and Bruce Davy. <laughs> Perhaps you know me as Joanne Davy, who taught at Sterling High School many, many years ago. There were many members of your church that I taught. Perhaps you saw me in the Logos Hope and saw me as OM missionary there. Um, but just. I'm standing here today as one of the missionaries that you as Ganubi Baptists support. And I want to start by saying thank you so much for the way that you love me and pray for me and support me. I couldn't be doing what I'm doing without you supporting me in it. So I was called to become a missionary when I was about nine years old. You can blame my parents for that. They um, taught me to follow Jesus. They brought missionaries into my home. They brought missionaries into our church. They um, had me read mission biographies. And so I didn't really have any other choice but to become a missionary. And so I now serve with OM in South Africa. Uh, For many years, I was in North Africa. I served in Sudan, working with street boys there until the government decided that um, they would interrogate us, put team members in prison, and kick me out of the country. So I was kicked out of Sudan. One minute I was there and 
48 hours later, I was not. Um, after that, I was called to go to Libya, and I served in Libya for six years using my high school maths teaching as my way to be there, but serving on a team where we were sharing the gospel over there. What a wonderful experience it was, and I really feel that God had me there for a reason. But now he has called me back to South Africa, and I serve with OM here in South Africa. My role at the moment is as liaison with the ship ministry. As the ship's coming through South Africa, I live on the ship for six months while it's here, and I am the coordinator with South Africa for the Logos Hope ministry. My regular role in OM is as training officer and development, people development. So. I'm involved in really training people and equipping them to go. As OM, our focus is on the least reached. The three billion people in the world. Let me say that again. Three billion people in the world that have never heard the gospel. And unless something changes for them, will never hear the gospel. And so we are passionate about that. That three billion of all the missionaries that go out around the world, only one out of ten go to the least reached. The three billion get one out of ten missionaries. And so as OM in South Africa particularly, we have a twofold focus. Number one is helping churches, helping individuals find their strategic place of involvement in that task to reach the least reached. So my question for you, what is your strategic place of involvement in least reaching the least reached? Well, one of the things that I know many of you do, and I just heard it as well to, here to, that's coming up, is you can pray. And I really want to encourage you we're very, very good at praying for our city, our families. Are we praying for the least reached? Are we praying for countries that don't have access to the gospel? One of the things I love doing as an auntie, I'm not married, so I don't have kids, but I get to spoil my nieces and nephews. And whenever I go and visit them, we are sure to have at least three cultural meals where I do some research, we eat food that night at supper around a particular culture, and then we spend time praying for that country and look up some kid-friendly prayer requests, and we spend time praying for that country. Are we praying for the least reached? Are we as families training up our children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews to be people of prayer for the least reached? The, th the second thing we're involved in is encouraging people to give. And I know this church gives to missions. And many of you as individuals also give to missions. But perhaps God is calling you to that ministry. Perhaps there is a missionary. I know Mitch and Kaylee were here a while ago talking about their call to Tunisia. Perhaps you could support them. I know this church goes on mission trips to Turkey. Perhaps there's someone on that, in that group that you can support. Perhaps God is calling you to support a missionary or a project. And the third one, pray, give. We can't take away from the fact that we are commanded to go. Often we talk about the Great Commission, go into all the world. I love that it's a commission. But by making that word commission, we sometimes forget that commission also means command. We are commanded to go. And really, I want to encourage you, how can you as individuals, as a church, go? Perhaps your going means joining Mark on a, a turkey trip. Perhaps your going means going to Oxford Street and sharing Jesus. There, I know there are groups in different churches that go to Oxford Street and share with people from other countries. 
There's Somalis there. There's Sudanese people. There are loads of people from around the world. I, I drive past whenever I come to Ganubi. There's a shop called Bismillah. That tells me there's Muslim people. There's, I know of an Algerian family in town who don't know Jesus. Here in Ganubi, I managed to connect them with some Algerians on the ship. God has brought the world to us here. We no longer have the excuse of saying, but I can't go. So often people come to me and say, Joanne, I was called to be a missionary when I was young. But, you know, I got married and had children and didn't go. Or I got a great job and I didn't go. So many people feel despondent that they haven't had the opportunity to go. God has brought the least reach right here to East London. Perhaps you as a younger person are looking at going to work abroad. That could be your going. We're no longer sending quite as many traditional missionaries who are supported. More and more people are going with their careers. I heard a wonderful story the other day of someone who works in town, and um, she gets sent to different countries for work for a month or a few weeks, and she always gets to choose where she wants to go. And she normally chooses the safe, comfortable places. And she said to me the other day, she said, Joanne, I now have a choice again. And this time I'm going to choose China. And I'm going to go and find out what I need to be praying for. I'm going to look for opportunities to meet with missionaries there. I'm going to look for opportunities to share in the few weeks that I have there. Perhaps you will never go as a traditional missionary. But you could go with your work those of you who are university students or, or, or students, maybe God's asking you to take your job and go. So as OM, we really want to help people find their place as they pray, as they give, as they go. But my main role is the equipping. How can we equip the church? How can we equip people who want to go into the nations with the tools that they need to be able to do it well. And that is what I love doing, is training people who've got a passion for the least reached and how to do that effectively. And so as I fulfill my role as part of South Africa, sending people to the least reached, I thank you again for your prayers for me as I do that for your support financially as the church supports me in what I'm doing. I really want to say to you that you are part of sending people to the least reached. Is there a way that you can be more involved in praying in giving and going and finding your place of involvement in this mission to reach the least reached? The three Billion. I don't know if that gets, gets you, but it gets me every time I say it. Three billion people like you and me who get up every morning, kiss their wife hello, <laughs> fight with their children, people who do not know about Jesus and may never have the chance to. How can you be involved in being part of the change? Thank you so much, Joe. And you're going to be with us after the service. So if anybody, if God has stirred something in your heart and you want to respond, Joe's available um, at the coffee, well, in the coffee hall, and just come and gra uh, have a chat with her and, yeah, see how God can use you. I'm going to call up the offering stewards now, please. And just as we do that, I just want to read a verse. Um, it's from 1 Thessalonians. And just the three kind of instructions that Paul gives us. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. And I read that this morning. And before I had even wiped the sleep out of my eyes, I was like, good morning, Lord. And I started my list of um, requests. 
and I hadn't even been thankful just that I had woken up um, and that I had life and family and a warm bed. And so this has really spoken to me this morning, thankful in all circumstances, when life looks good and when it doesn't. And never stop praying, even when it's really, really difficult. Even when you just sit before God and say, Lord, send help, please. So this morning, as we respond in worship, wherever you find yourself in life, if there's one thing that you can just hold on to, to be thankful for, to be joyful for, one prayer you can offer God. That is our encouragement this morning. So let's just pray for the tithes and offerings and then we'll worship together. Jesus, we thank you that we get to be here. After hearing Joe share about so many people who don't even know you, God. We thank you that we get to stand in such freedom and worship you with our hands held high, God. That is something to be thankful for. And we just commit this morning to you, God. We thank you for the resources that you bring in to our church so that we can support the missionaries. So that your name will be extended throughout the earth, God. So we commit this morning to you, Jesus. For all your glory and honor, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Right, let's stand and worship this morning. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move, and as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. 
When all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I find, I find on my knees, with my hands lifted high, oh God, I belong to you. And every year I live at your feet, I sing through the night. And Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I see through the night. Lord, the battle belongs to you this morning. Let's sing, God, you're so good. Amazing love that welcomes me. The kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly. My soul undeserving, and God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. Behold the cross, and age to age, and hour by hour. The dead are raised, the sinner saved, the work of your power. God, you're so You're so good. And God, you're so good. And God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. I am blessed. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power, for the glory, Jesus' name.
And should this life bring suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has brought for me, both now and forever. God, you're so Just so good. You 
place this morning. Holy Spirit, as we receive your word now, won't you just fill us up? Won't you just enter all the cracks in our hearts, God? Jesus, we worship you in this place. We pray all of these things in your precious name. Amen. Thank you so much to Mace and the team. I just absolutely love that song, I Exalt Thee. I think it's one of the first songs we'll sing when we get to heaven one day. I Exalt Thee. Yes, for Thou, O Lord. In fact, if things work out well, I might lead you in that a bit later. But don't hold your breath. I might, I say. I might. I'm so excited about this message that anything's possible come the end of this word, so we'll see. Um, Just to encourage you, as Meg said, on a Wednesday night, Wednesday evening, half past six, we're getting together um, as a church family to pray and to worship. We want to pray for our church and for our own needs. We want to pray for our nation, South Africa. We want to pray for the Middle East. We want to pray for the world. And so half past six to half past seven on Wednesday, Come and join us for a wonderful time of prayer and praise. If you've got your Bibles with you, let's turn in God's Word to the Old Testament. It's the book of 2 Chronicles, quite a tricky book to find, so you might have to go to the index. 2 Chronicles chapter 20.
2 Chronicles chapter 20. And I'm entitled this morning's message, When the Battle Picks You. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'll read the first six verses, but we'll cover some more ground as we go along. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Nev, you've got it there? You're battling. I thought you looks like you in uh, Galatians. So Galatians, you're well away from Chronicles. That's correct. But anyway, why Nev finds it, let me read to you. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Meunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from, from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek God. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand. And no one is able to withstand you. Just the first six verses, but I guarantee we'll cover some more ground as we go along this morning. You know, some of the best advice I ever received uh, growing up was learn to pick your battles. Maybe somebody gave you that advice as well as a youngster. Learn to pick your battles. Um, and I've learned over the years, don't be tempted when you're upset, when you're emotional, to send that WhatsApp. Some of you have sent it, and you regret having sent it, or that email. Um, learn to pick your battles. Um, that's when Simon, remember Simon from last week? Simon wants to rise up, and he wants to say things that Simon shouldn't say. By the way, how many have found Simon was under control this week? More under control than usual. I got a compliment last night as I was driving down the Ganubi Main Road from my wife. I was so pleased. She said, Mark, more and more, Simon is under control. I, I felt so happy about that. It made my day. So learn to pick your battles. Um, even within the context of marriage, come to think of it, learn to pick your battles. Um, I know that every now and again, Paul and I get into a, not a tiff, but a, a robust debate. And I, not an argument, but a bit of discussion about something. And halfway through the debate, I realize I'm wrong. But I've argued myself in such a strong position, Neville. I've covered such good ground that I can't go back. It's called pride. Learn to pick your battles. But what happens this morning, I want to ask you, what happens... When you've got no choice in the matter, and the battle picks you. Something comes across your path that you didn't ask for, that you didn't anticipate, and you certainly didn't deserve. But there it is, like a massive giant confronting you. Different battles for different people. And I guarantee if we had to share the microphone around this morning, many people would say, I'm facing a battle in a certain area of my life. And so the question this morning is, when those giants present themselves, and when the battle you didn't choose confronts you, what's your plan of action? What's your modus operandi? Where do you plan on turning in those moments when the battle chooses you? And that's exactly what happened to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. You know, under his leadership, if you do the research, Judah was experiencing a season of wonderful revival, spiritual renewal in the land. Things were going well. And then suddenly, 
unexpectedly, this good man, this godly king, receives bad news. And here the bad news is in verse 2. Some of his servants come and say this to him in verse 2. They say, King, a vast army, maybe your Bible uses the words a great multitude. Some people estimate that multitude to be about around 3 million enemy soldiers coming from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. And in fact, it's already in Hazazon Temar in Gedi. Friends, what had happened was three enemy armies had joined forces together against the people of Judah. And they were coming to attack the people of God from a very unusual direction. From a very surprising direction. Usually they would come from the north or they would come from the east. But this time they were coming from the south. And by the time Jehoshaphat receives the news, in fact these three million enemy soldiers were only about 50 kilometers away. In other words, the attack is imminent. He hasn't got time to put together a military strategy. He hasn't got time to organize a proper defense. These enemy armies had caught them by surprise. And if we think about that, how is that not true of life? Many of us can relate to that. For a long period of time in different areas of your life, things can be plain sailing everything going well no sign of anything untoward but little do you know that behind the scenes an enemy army is brewing a storm is arriving it's going to be so powerful and so unexpected that it has the potential to rock your life to rock your family to rock your marriage and even to rock your faith when the battle picks you, what is your plan of action? We find many people in Ganubi turning to the usual suspects. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, isolation. Or, in those moments, do you do what Jehoshaphat did? Do you seek the face of God? Have a look at verse 3. Jehoshaphat responds like this. Alarmed. Well, of course, he was a human being. Of course he would be alarmed. But he resolved. I love that word. Resolve means he made a decision within the deep part of who he was to inquire of the Lord. If you're reading the New King James Version, I love that even better. It says Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord. I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to make a quick impulsive decision. I'm not going to act in the flesh, which we often tempted to do, as a first step. In the face of this great enemy army, as a first step, I'm going to set my face to seek the Lord. I'm going to inquire of God. Friends, I wrote in my Bible this week, that is not casual Christianity. This is deeper than that. This is in the heat of the battle, in the face of the enemy. I'm going to intentionally invest time in the presence of God. I'm going to seek the face of God because He is my rock and my fortress. He is my refuge and my strength. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. As a first step, I'm going to seek the face of Almighty God. Not only that, but look what he does in verse 4. He says, I'm going to get others to seek the face of God with me. Exactly what we're going to do as a church family on Wednesday night. Exactly this. Verse 4. The people of Judah came together. Yes, that's going to be us on Wednesday evening. To seek help from the Lord. They came from every town in Judah to seek God. But then here's our focus for this morning. Have a look at the prayer. The prayer he prays in verse 6. And friend, I would say to you this morning, if you're facing a battle, and I know that many of you are facing battles in different areas, I would recommend you pray verse 6 every day this week or for as long as is necessary. Look at the power of the words of verse 6. 
in the face of these enemy armies, Jehoshaphat begins to say these words. He says, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Can you see what's happening? The man's focus is shifting. It's shifting from what's coming against him to the one who reigns over him. And friends, that shift will make all the difference in your life. You start shifting your gaze. You start shifting your focus from what's coming against you to the one who reigns over you. You know, as we think about the personal battles that we face, as we think about the battles we face as a nation, and those are many, as you think about the global challenges we face, may I challenge you this morning as a child of God today, where is your focus? What is consuming you? Where is your attention focused? And just in case you're not sure, you'll know where your focus is very quickly by listening to the words that are coming out of your mouth. Because the Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What words are you speaking? What are you posting on social media? Because your mouth will betray you. Your mouth will give away what's going on in your heart. Where is your focus this morning? Because where the mind goes, the man follows. Where is your focus? And I know we can sing it. I raise a hallelujah, one of my favorite songs. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. My question is, in the heat of the battle, when the rubber hits the road, and life gets hard, and life gets dark. Are we living and speaking like we believe it? When the battle chooses you. You've always got that option. You can become consumed like many of us do by worry, by anxiety. You can even choose the road of fear if you want to. Or in the face of that enemy army, in the face of that doctor's diagnosis, in the face of that relational challenge, that financial struggle, in the face of the global climate we see on television, as a child of God, you can make a choice to lift up your eyes and to focus on the greatness, the power, and the sovereignty of God. Where is your focus today? Not only does he worship, but he takes it a step further in verse 7. And he reminds himself, and he reminds the people of the faithfulness of God. This is a good one. The faithfulness of God, verse 7. He says, Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And he goes on to speak about the faithfulness of God in days gone by. And friends, here's what he's saying. He's saying, God, you've done it before. And so, God, you can do it again. And so as you remember, as you remind yourself of God's faithfulness in days gone by, what happens? You find fresh faith beginning to rise in your heart for today's battle. You know what? We can't control, for the most part, who comes against us or what comes against us. These are battles that none of us would choose if we had a choice. We can't control what or who comes against us, but we sure can choose our response. And friends, in the heat of the moment, as that giant threatens to intimidate you and fill your heart with fear, I encourage you to remember. I encourage you to remind yourself of what? Of God's faithfulness in days gone by. Of the goodness of God in days gone by. Because I'm telling you this morning, as God was faithful and good to previous generations, He will be faithful 
and good to you. In fact, this morning as I was showering, I was singing at the top of my lungs, all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And I will sing of the goodness of God, not just on the mountaintops, but in the valleys, the fires, and the storms of life. My declaration is, my God is good, and my God is faithful. One of the most beautiful examples I've ever seen of this in real life are friends of mine, Tilman and Suzanne. They arrived in Turkey more or less the same time as us in 1999. Just beautiful people, wonderful couple. And in fact, they were part of the same church family as, as us for a couple of years. But as the battle would have it, the battle picked Tilman, and Tilman was brutally murdered and martyred for his faith in Jesus. He was stabbed 136 times. His throat was slit. And he died the death of a martyr in southeastern Turkey. And he left behind that beautiful family. There's his wife, Suzanne, and his son, Timothy's age, and two beautiful daughters. That's the family Tilman left behind. But you know what? On the day of Tilman's memorial service, it was a day just like this. I remember just like this, light mist and light rain. And across that graveyard, as the Turkish television cameras rolled, the sounds of worship began to rise. And what was the song that that lady chose to sing in the face of death and martyrdom? I'll tell you what she sung. She sung this, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Lord, you give and you take away. But even in this time of martyrdom and death and heartache, my heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name. My friends, the anniversary of that martyrdom was on Friday. All those years later, that family continues to love and serve and live in the very city where Tillman died. The sounds of worship have triumphed over martyrdom, fueled by the goodness and faithfulness of God. Where is your focus this morning? How are you reacting to that giant? Are you overwhelmed by fear? Or are you like Suzanne, in the face of opposition, in the face even of death, are you lifting your voice in worship to Almighty God because He is good and He is faithful. Well, back to Jehoshaphat. Have a look at verse 15 because here comes the verse for somebody today. This is why God brought you to church this morning. This is the key to the whole thing. Verse 15. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Is that somebody this morning? Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, these three million enemy soldiers coming against you. Because here's the truth, Jehoshaphat. Here's the truth. The truth is, the battle is not yours, but God's. Friends, have a careful look at that verse. Some of us today need to make a conscious decision to give some battles back to God. For too long, you've been fighting this battle in your own strength. You've been fighting this battle in your own wisdom. And today, you've grown weary. You've grown discouraged. That is you. And today, God invites you, look carefully at this verse and surrender that battle. Hand over that battle to God and remind yourself the battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. Now sit back and let me read these verses to you. And as I read them, may faith begin to rise even as I read these words to you. Just imagine you were there that day. Early in the morning, 
they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, people of God. Listen to me, Judah, and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in His prophets, and you will be successful. Verse 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Imagine you were there that day in the very front of the army of God are not warriors but worshippers. In the very front of the army of God are people who are lifting their voice to Jesus, to Almighty God, singing, Give thanks to the Lord, for His love endures forever. We're not going to focus on the enemy armies. In the face of the enemy, we're going to focus on the character of our God, and we are going to worship Him. Give thanks to the Lord, for His love endures forever. You know what? If you do the research in Scripture, you will find that is not a once-off example. Let me give you a New Testament equivalent. Acts 16. In Acts 16, we find Paul and Silas. What had happened to them? Well, they'd been arrested. They'd been stripped naked. They'd been severely beaten. They'd been placed in chains. And they'd been thrown into the inner prison. When the battle chooses you. Good men on the receiving end of injustice. What did they do in response, I wonder? Well, get your seatbelts on. This is verse 25. At about midnight, Paul and Silas were throwing a pity party and posting on social media. Oh no, that's not what it says, sorry. At about midnight, Paul and Silas We're praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Friend, I want you to get your mind around this. Worshipping in the middle of the night. Worshipping in the middle of the prison. Worshipping in chains. Worshipping Almighty God. What happened? Well, something no one could ever have anticipated happened. Verse 26. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. What would happen if that happened at Fort Glamorgan? I wonder. We'd have an exodus of prisoners like we've never seen before. Not these men. Friends, the power of God. If you read Acts chapter 16, the power of God is released in response to the praise of His people. And I want to try and get, get this through to you as strongly as I can today. We're not simply talking here about singing songs. You know, Mason and the team, before I preached... Let us do half an hour of praise and worship. We're not talking about singing songs, mouthing words for 25 minutes. I'm talking about something totally different this morning. I'm talking about worshiping Almighty God in the power of the Spirit. And when it happens, you know it's happening. Ephesians chapter 5 says this. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another 
in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Friends, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about men and women who in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the face of the enemy, are worshiping Almighty God. There is power in that kind of worship. In fact, one of my heroes, Mary Slosser, missionary to China, put it this way. I just love the way she put it. She says, I sing the doxology. From you are all things. To you are all things. We've sung it. I sing the doxology and dismiss the devil. Because worship is a powerful weapon against darkness. So how does the story end? Well, it ends in verse 22. Let me read it to you. As they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mansia who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. Friends, get your mind around that verse, that enemy army, which looks so strong and so intimidating in verse 1, is now reduced to nothing as the power of God is released in response to the praise and the worship of His people. And I would end this morning by saying to you, He who has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. We are living, all of us, in critical days. We are living in some of the most challenging days this planet has ever seen. And my question to you is, what will the response be of the church of Jesus Christ to the challenges of our day? Will we cower away in fear? Or will we face the enemy from a space of worship, from a space of faith, from a place of worship, reminding ourselves that our God is faithful and He is good. I want to call up the worship team to join me up front. We're going to respond to God's Word this morning. Just for a moment, bow your head. I want to guide you through some thoughts. This morning we've spoken about when the battle chooses you. And friends, I think if we're honest this morning, many of us are facing battles that we would never have chosen. For some of us, the future is very, very uncertain. There are so many question marks over tomorrow. And what went through my mind this morning as I was praying for the service is God actually knows battles ahead of us that we don't yet even know about. And maybe this morning God is calling you as a first step to seek His face. Not to go down the road of worry or fear, but as a step number one this morning to determine in your heart to seek the face of God. God, what do you say about this situation? What do you say about this circumstance? For somebody else, maybe you've lost focus. And even now, your words have betrayed you. Because the words coming out of your mouth are betraying the condition of your heart. And although you say you're a person of faith, in fact, fear, has gripped you. And so this morning, God is calling you to shift your focus from what's coming against you to the one who reigns over you. I want to give a chance for somebody to respond to that this morning. Shift your focus 
from what's coming against you to the one who reigns over you. A key word for somebody else this morning is the word remember. We're so quick to forget. And today God wants to remind you. He says, remember, remember, remember. Remember my faithfulness to you. In battles you fought yesterday. My faithfulness to you is you dealt with battles 10 years ago, 20 years ago. As I was faithful to you in those days and in those battles, I will be faithful to you today. Trust me. Rest in me. Look to me. And maybe for somebody else this morning, if you really are honest, You've grown tired. You've grown so weary. In fact, you're almost at that point of throwing in the towel. And the reason is you've been fighting for too long in your own strength. And today God says, the battle belongs to the Lord. You've got to surrender that battle. You would have laid that battle down at the feet of Jesus. And you would have leave the outcome in his hands. Friends, that's freedom. That is peace. And that is rest. The battle belongs to the Lord. So why don't we stand to our feet? And I'm going to ask Mason and the team to lead us through a song. And we're not going to sing. We're going to worship in the power of the Spirit. And our declaration will be over our lives and over our nation and over the Middle East and over the world. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's stand and sing together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe with you. So when I find I'll find on my knees, with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sleep through the night. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty So when I find I find on my knees, my hands lifted up, oh God, that'll be lost to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll see through the night, oh God, that'll be lost to you. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. We shine in the 
shadow You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God And almighty fortress You go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God You shine in the shadow You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fall out on my knees with my hands lifted high, oh God, I will lost in you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I see through the night. Yes, Lord, the battle belongs to you. Amen. Amen. Father, that is our declaration today. That overall, over our lives, our marriages, our children, our grandchildren, our families, our futures, our health, our Lord, our nation, the world, the battle belongs to you. And Lord, you have been faithful to generations gone by. You will be faithful to us. And so, Father, part us with your blessing today. May we go in peace. And may the peace of Almighty God go with us until we meet again. In the great name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Friends, just to remind you, in case you may have forgotten, there's coffee waiting for you in the hall behind me. But maybe more importantly, if you need prayer for anything, we've got people up front here to pray for you. Don't miss out on that opportunity. See you next time. Amen.